some scientists climb mountains to study wildlife. Dustin Partridge takes the elevator. So up on this roof in particular, we've actually had 30 species of bird. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. And we've had a huge diversity of insects and arthropods as well up here. So this, if you look at this, this is almost an island of green and a sea of concrete. We already know that green roofs can cool our buildings and absorb storm water. But there wasn't really much research that had been done to say if they actually provide habitat for wildlife. So I was very curious if these small roofs that are actually being greened and managed, if wildlife is able to find it and if they're able to use it. To find out, Dustin has been studying 14 of New York's green roofs, including the enormous Javits Convention Center. This is a huge green roof. Well, this is actually the second largest green roof in the country. This is a massive green roof, yeah. So this is one of the herring gull nests. Dustin has identified 15 bird species up here. So there's a lot of bones from yeah, like chickens, but then we also have fish bones from the river. He's also caught all kinds of insects in his traps. And his colleague, Caitlin, has recorded five different types of bats here. Dustin did not expect this diversity of wildlife because the only thing growing up here is sedum. Sedum, this is kind of what you see here. It's just kind of this low succulent plant and it's really a great green roof plant. They don't grow too tall, which actually is an issue for structural diversity. So we weren't expecting too much. But now what's interesting about this roof is it's so large that it actually can host a number of species. So it's because this roof is so big that you're seeing the diversity that you are. Right. This rooftop in Little Italy is much smaller, a tiny fraction of the size of Javits. And yet Dustin has spotted twice as many bird species here. The difference is in the plants. So this roof is pretty interesting. This roof has much deeper soil, which allows for all these larger plants to be growing. There's yeah. trees, there's actual trees up yeah. here. Which you can see are already available for birds to be using as perches. There are mockingbirds nesting in the bushes right. down there. Yeah despite being kind of in the middle of nothing but urbanness. I mean, this looks like a great habitat right here, but right. if you go right over the edge, it's nothing but concrete. So isolation is definitely gonna be something that's keeping the wildlife biodiversity down on this roof. Whereas if this roof was situated right next to a large park, right. it would probably be a different story. This rooftop in Brooklyn is a bit closer to other green spaces. And that does seem to help wildlife find its way here. On this roof, I've seen 25 bird species up here. So, and then compare that to a conventional roof. I mean, if you look around, there's nothing on these roofs. To consider right. that this, what we're standing on, which is now a hotspot for biodiversity, used to be that, which is almost barren. It really does make a difference. 700 miles away, Kelly Kazak is also studying how green roofs support life. But she's interested in plant life. My goal for this project is to see if it's possible to replicate shortgrass prairies on green roofs in Chicago. So I started by going out to shortgrass prairies in the Chicago region. And so I found which grasses and which forbs were commonly growing. This one, for example, is a purple prairie clover. And this is a little blue stem, which is a common prairie grass. And you can see it's doing very well and it's flowered. These plants are not only thriving up here, but they seem to be improving the green roof's performance. I found that the prairie plants can actually absorb more stormwater than traditional green roofs because the plants that we have growing here have more fibrous root systems and so they can absorb the water very quickly. But the biggest winners here may be the plants themselves. These plants in particular that are used to living in shortgrass prairie have lost most of their habitat. So we're in Illinois, which is called the prairie state, but from the 1800s until now, we've lost over 99% of our native prairie. And so you can see that there's really not a lot of spaces for these plants to live. However, there are a lot of rooftops. And so this gives us an opportunity to provide the plants with habitat in a spot that really humans aren't using very much right now anyway. There's no shortage of rooftop space in American cities. And it's possible that if more of this space were green, it could transform urban neighborhoods into wildlife corridors. If you look at the roofs that we were on today, they're all kind of isolated, they're alone. 
But now if you look around those roofs, you see so many roofs that are devoid of anything. Yeah. Now if you could start picturing those roofs having green space on them, having right. some sort of a green roof, all of a sudden it's almost becoming this network of green spaces from parks to green roofs to vacant lots. And it becomes this network that's available for birds and bats as well that are going to be moving through. It just adds the green space that's in the city, which in many cities, and like New York, is pretty devoid. Urban nature is made possible in part by the following. <laughs>